Hello, dear listeners. I'm back from my hiatus. I apologize for not releasing an episode anytime recently. Uh, I believe I owe you an explanation. Unfortunately, recently, my neighbor's house burned down. Now, a little bit of context. My neighbor and I do not get along. We never have. We've had a property dispute for a long time. And he accused me of arson. Um, I have a reputation to uphold in my community. So we went to the sheriff's office. The sheriff gave me the hot iron. I took my paces. He put the bandage on. And everything was going fine day one. Then day two, I started to feel blisters. I thought I felt an infection. And I got scared. And I fled. And we all know what this means. Um, I'm now at an undisclosed location on the continent and, um, uh, it's been difficult to transition, but I'm back to recording now. I obviously am innocent of this crime, but for some reason, God decided to afflict me with that infection. I think it must have something to do with that one time with the Danes where we, well, never mind. uh, I have with me Professor John Hudson from St. Andrews, uh, so let's get to that. <music> professor John G. H. Hudson is Bishop Wardlaw Professor and Director of the Institute of Legal and Constitutional Research at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and L. Bates Lee Global Professor of Law at Michigan Law School. His teaching and research focus on 9th to 13th century England and northern France, particularly the fields of law, lordship, and literature. His writings include The Formation of the English Common Law, which we discussed today, and F.W. Maitland and the Englishness of English Law, among many other works. I am going to start by giving the audience a little uh, context to where your book takes place. Um, We are starting off in the late Anglo-Saxon period, and your book goes through the conquest and up to uh, 1215, and specifically Magna Carta. Uh, So with that historical background, I just want to sort of lay out the uh, framework for the audience in terms of what we're talking about when we're talking about courts. Could you give a description of what courts were like in the Anglo-Saxon period, and then we can move through the relevant time period? Okay. Courts were quite largely multi-purpose assemblies, and that would be true of the lowest courts, which were in administrative units called hundreds, which are part of a county, part of a shire. Uh, County is the post-conquest word, shire is the old English word, Uh, and then right up to the king's court. So some of their business will will be legal, Others, it would be to do with what we would think of as police matters rather than judicial matters. And then there'd be other things which we would consider probably economic or financial or political as much as legal. And this would be true of the various levels of court. Lowest ones of importance are what I've just referred to, the hundred court. Then you have the county court and then you have the king's court. And you probably also have urban courts as well, what were called borough courts. And they will be particularly important for the witnessing of transactions, most notably cattle sales, other types of economic transactions, notably sales or grants of land, would probably take place in either hundred or county courts. That's very helpful. And so were these courts uh, sort of communicating with each other um, uh, vertically, horizontally? Yeah, we probably shouldn't be thinking in terms of clear boundaries of jurisdiction. The Hunter Court probably deals with most types of crime, apart from those that involve the death penalty. Uh, The County Court probably deals with quite a lot of land cases and more serious crimes. King's Court will be the court for the people with the most Im- involving the most important offence people. So uh, disputes between aristocrats, for example, and also certain major offences or major land cases. 
Now, it is possible for land for cases to move from one type of court to another, probably typically from one of these local courts, the, con the county or the hundred up to the king's court. But there isn't a system of what we would call appeal. Rather, there tends to be an accusation against the people running the court that either false judgment has been given or that judgment has been refused. So what there is, what passes to the higher court isn't a dispute, isn't a rehearing of the dispute between the two litigants, which is what we have in appeals, but rather it is an accusation by one of the litigants, the disappointed litigant, against the court holder or against members of the court. Understood. Okay. And surely not everyone in the society was legally trained. Who was sitting on these courts? Um, and it, did it matter which court you're talking about? Okay. Uh, in, there, there are probably people with greater legal knowledge, but there's no legal profession at this time. So legal, being a legal specialist would just be someone who's particularly interested or particularly skilled in the workings of these courts. Now, judgments in these courts are made by members of the court. There aren't judges, specialist judges making judgments. And the type of people who are making up the court will vary according to the size, the le social level of the court. So the 100 court will be made up of the local free population, entirely men, uh, which is probably five to 10% of the uh, population will be attending those 100 courts. People deciding cases and attending the county court will be of higher status. And obviously people attending the king's court will be of higher status still. And the sort of ways in which they judge, there will be a considerable amount of law involved in this, but there may be also other social considerations such as people's reputation uh, becomes involved and also considerable pressure that you get a settlement rather than go to a judgment. And how did the Norman conquest affect these courts? The major effect of the Norman conquest in terms of change seems to be the introduction of Lord's courts. As far as we can tell, uh, Anglo-Saxon Lords did not have jurisdiction over their men simply because they were their men. In Anglo-Norman England, probably introduced from Normandy, is the notion of a Lord's Court, which deals with matters of landholding between the Lord and his men or between the Lord's men. And that is a major change that occurs. Equally important, though, is the continuation of the Anglo-Saxon courts of the courts of the hundred and of the county. And the coexistence of Lord's courts and these courts of local administrative areas will have a very considerable importance in what happens in the second half of the 12th century. The other change that seems to happen soon after the Norman Conquest, but not directly as a result of the Norman Conquest, is the establishment of separate ecclesiastical courts. In the Anglo-Saxon period, there probably weren't separate ecclesiastical courts. Rather, the county court was presided over both by either the sheriff or the earl, one of the people in charge of the county, and the bishop. So there will be a separation of ecclesiastical or spiritual business from secular business, but within the same court. In the 11th century, around the period of 1066, when the Norman Conquest takes place, there's a major church reform movement going on, which is seeking to se separate out ecclesiastical and secular matters. And across Europe, there is a development of separate treatment of clerics and separate treatment of matters that concern the care of souls, so spiritual matters. And this means that from probably about 1070, separate ecclesiastical courts develop in England. Now, during this time, the King's Court is continuing to exist. The, B, the Duke of Normandy, who conquered England, had uh, his own court in Normandy, and that and the King's Court in England were probably very similar. So the King's Court in England continues when the Duke of Normandy becomes King of England. 
The crucial extension of the activity of the King's Court comes in the reign of Henry II from the 1160s onwards, where the King's Court starts to travel much more frequently throughout the land. You have what are called visits by itinerant justices, traveling justices, who go and take the King's Court round in circuits in the country and hear cases in generally in different county towns. And they hear a large amount of business. And they are probably also the same, or generally also the same people who are sitting when the King's Court is sitting centrally, be it in a fixed location at Westminster or be it in the King's presence himself. So both the traveling court and the central court, they are both the King's Court. They are not separate types of jurisdiction. And that is crucial to the ex expansion of the business and of the jurisdiction of the King's Court from the latter part of the 12th century onwards. And that concept should be very familiar to American lawyers. Uh, we had Supreme Court justices who rode circuit. Um, I don't actually know when that practice ended exactly, but you, you were a member of the Supreme Court. You heard cases at the Capitol, but you also rode circuit and you heard, heard cases throughout uh, the country. So that's a practice that lived into the colonies, I suppose. Before we leave courts, I have to ask, A, how you get people in courts, and then B, what, how did you present evidence in courts? And I would like you also to briefly just talk about ordeals because it always fascinates the audience. Okay. Uh, getting people into court is the big problem in the Middle Ages. And we'll probably come back to this when uh, we talk about crime. But getting criminals actually turn up to court is very, very difficult. For other offences, including land offences, the two main methods, one of which is called attachment, which is getting guarantees that they will turn up in court. And these can be people, what would be called pledges, or it can be the giving of something valuable, a gauge. And the other is a process which lives on in contemporary law, which is referred to as either distress or distraint, uh, which involves taking away someone's property, generally first their movable goods and then their landed property. Uh, and if they don't turn up in court, you escalate the form of distress. So these are the two main ways of pressuring people to get into court. Once there, uh, Generally, what happens is each side, well, one side will state it's either its claim or its complaint. Uh, the other will deny it. And then there may be various forms of argument and also various forms of presentation of evidence. And this can be, for example, in land case, presenting a charter to establish your title to the land. In a criminal case, it may be witnesses who've seen events and so on. And generally, what then happens is that the court, the body of people who make up the court, decide who is to have to make proof. Now, we tend to think in terms of the burden of proof, quite often in medieval terms, you may rather think in terms of the benefit of proof. So, for example, if you've got charters establishing your claim to the land, proof may be that you have to swear that the land is yours. And then if you establish that, you will be able to keep the land. Some cases, though, are very difficult to decide. And this may be for a variety of reasons, but most obviously when there is no clear evidence of a particular concealed offence. Classic example would, for example, be adultery. And it's in that type of case that trial by ordeal may have been most important. And in the Anglo-Saxon period, there were two main forms of trial by ordeal. Trial by hot iron, where a piece of iron weighing about a pound gets heated up and then you have to carry it for three paces. Your hand is then bound up. Three days later, the binding is opened and it's discovered whether your hand is clean or foul, i.e. whether it is uh, 
clean or pussy, whether it's infected. And the latter means that you're guilty. The other is trial by cold water, which produces an instant result. You're thrown into water uh, it, with a cord or something around you with a knot on it to mark how far you have to sink. And if you sink to that point, you're cleared. If you float, you're rejected by the element and therefore you are guilty. The normal conquest leads to the introduction of what is in effect a third form of ordeal, which is trial by battle, where in a criminal accusation, for example, the complainant, or if it's been a homicide case, the closest relative of the complainant fights against the person who's accused. And the person who wins is the person who has proved their charge or proved their de denial. Got it. Those are interesting methods of... Uh resolving disputes i think between them i would prefer trial by uh, battle or ordeal by battle um i'm afraid of water so i don't want to don't want to deal with that but uh anyway we can start to switch to substantive matters um i just want to tell the audience ahead of time that your book focuses mostly on actually almost exclusively on two uh two areas of law criminal law and property law and i found this interesting just because i think today we have sort of a perception of criminal laws being public law and property law being private law. Um, I think that distinction can be overwrought sometimes. And I think your book shows that, that they're both very important um, for different reasons today, but obviously in, in the legal uh, corpus generally, uh, everything interacts. So I just, I just wanted to point that out ahead of time, but we can start with criminal law. Um, you know, I guess, first of all, what what kinds of crimes were people concerned with punishing at this point in time? How did they get criminals? How did they, you know, uh, arrest them? And how did they try them and punish them? Okay. Certainly from the royal point of view, the most important crime in Anglo-Saxon England uh, doesn't seem to be homicide. It seems to be theft. And the major royal efforts to deal with theft now, this may be to overstate the case slightly. The king is concerned with various types of homicide, but there is a remaining notion that homicide may be settled, dealt with privately, be it by revenge or by compensation. And then around that, there are various other offences which recur as serious offences, uh, most notably arson, also abduction, so those are the most those are the ones which people express most concern with. Catching criminals throughout the Middle Ages is a real problem. In general, you either catch them immediately or they've run away. And what you do with them once you've run away, they've run away, uh, you summon them several times to court, and if they don't turn up, you outlaw them. And if they've been outlawed, if they are captured they may be summarily tried and put to death. So the main effect of criminal accusation may well be outlawry rather than punishment. If you do catch someone soon after, they may again, if they are in possession of goods or have blood on their hands, they again may face fairly summary justice and would fail, face the death penalty. And the death penalty in general is carried out by hanging. In other cases, it may well be that there are certain forms both of compensation and of monetary penalty. So I talked about homicide being possibly compensatable in some cases. If so, there's a certain amount that you have to pay to the family to set up the case, and you may well have to make payment or one to the lord of the person concerned, but also to the king. So there's a combination of what we would think of as fines and what we would think of as compensation or damages. The number of criminals, as I've said, getting punished is probably considerably smaller than the number of offences. So one of the reasons that the kings, or one of the reasons for the broad use of the death penalty promoted by kings must be one of deterrence. 
How effective it is, given that everyone just flees, is very hard to tell. Yeah, and on outlawry, um, I think, at least when I'm reading about it, it doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, but you really have to think about how uh, severe that must be in in this time period. If you're an outlaw, you're just basically having to go in the woods or something for, for the rest of your life or yeah. uh, flee to but the continent. You, you, you have to get out of your area, and that will be the big thing. Uh, and a lot of people must be been outlawed and just resettled somewhere else. But it's the complete loss of social links and of your economic support. Uh, so it, it is actually quite a big deal. Got it. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the royal concern with keeping uh, peace um, and fighting crime. Uh, was this a priority for any king, any king in particular? Um, and why? Uh, uh, keeping the peace is one of the main duties of kingship. Uh, kings at the beginning of their reign make three promises, one of which is to protect the church and keep the peace, uh, and another of which is to punish offenders and get rid of bad laws. So it's central to the duties of kingship. Uh, yeah. Why do people obey kings? Partly because they're scared of them, but also because they think that kings fulfill a function that without a king maintaining the peace, uh, you're going to be worse off. So it is central to the actions of kingship. Quite largely, the actual responsibility, obviously, for keeping peace, uh, and even for hearing about offences, is likely to be devolved either to local officials or to lords who enjoy privileges from the king, or to the traveling justices by the time that you get to Henry II's reign. But that thing of the maintenance of peace is seen as one of the main Christian duties of a king, and the ideas can be easily traced back to the Bible and to Old, Old Testament kingship. Okay, yeah, and you talk about Stephen, the sort of the disorder surrounding Stephen's reign um, in the book, and when I, when I read just general history books, I often think about, you know, there's big battles and it's kind of crazy, but you got to think for these people in these societies, uh, there's a lot of crime that happens. It's, it must be incredibly uh, frustrating and scary to live in such a time where criminals essentially go unpunished. You have some, I, I recommend to the listeners, there's some interesting anecdotes about some uh, criminal behavior during this period, but um, it definitely has tremendous societal costs outside of just there being big battles over uh, who's going to be the king. Yeah, I mean, Kings present themselves as the, the protectors of the weak, most notably widows and orphans, against oppressive lordship. So the between the king and the church, you provide much of the ideology of kingship. There is the idea that if you take away kings, basically evil lords will oppress people. And the aim of kingship in that ecclesiastical view of kingship is to prevent this happening. Presumably, there was a sort of situation where people would spend periods where they're complaining about the kings being oppressive, they react against it, then the reaction produces disorder, and then people start desiring strong kingship again. And that seems to be the pattern that we have in the 12th century with what you were referring to. Strong kingship under Henry I, reaction under Stephen, desire for king, strong kingship again under the next king, Henry II. Okay, and I definitely want to put a pin in that for the discussion that we're going to have about Magna Carta later. We were talking about compensation payments, and King certainly is involved in these, but a lot of criminal cases must have been settled out of court. If you think about either petty crimes, yeah, minor thefts and so on, or classically punch-ups, things happening without weapons, a lot of these must have been dealt with by outside settlement, out-of-court settlement. And the same actually would be true of some fairly serious crimes, most notably homicide. So the pattern of dispute settlement not involving court judgment, which obviously now is a major part of the criminal law system because very few cases go to judgment, that is very much paralleled in the medieval period. 
judgment is possible, but rare. Great. Understood. Okay. With that, I think we can move on to property law. And I first just want to emphasize how important property law was at this period of time. Property law was not just about owning a house. Um, there were a lot of political rights which were associated with uh, property rights. Um, on that topic, can you uh, can we start with the Anglo-Saxon period? Uh, what do we know about property law during the Anglo-Saxon period? And then after that, we can discuss how it changes throughout our period. Okay, the one of the oddities with Anglo-Saxon England is we know quite a lot about it through what are called the Anglo-Saxon laws. And these are documents of various types which reflect royal legislation. What's odd about them is that they say very little about property law. And so for property law, we have to look at various types of documents from the field of transactional law, conveyances of land, leases, wills, and so on. And piecing together what the situation is, is really pretty hard to do. We know most about what's going on at the top level of society. And there probably two main types of land are important. One is called bookland. And bookland is land which is held with a, what's called a book. And a book just means a piece of writing, a charter. And this seems to be a land that has been transferred with the fullest possible transfer of rights. So what we would think of as a transfer of ownership. Second type of land is called loan land, i.e. leased land, land that's been loaned. And we know that a lot of land was held by lease. Lease sometimes for life, sometimes for three lives. And beyond that, you need to remember, of course, that the same land may be both book land and loan land. So you have an earl, a great aristocrat, who has the land as book land, and then he leases it to someone else as loan land. So those are the two critical forms of land holding at the aristocratic level in Anglo-Saxon England. Okay, and you discuss these characteristics of property law, um, tenure, alienability, and heritability. Can you discuss those three concepts in Anglo-Saxon England? Okay. And modern lawyers often think about ownership in terms of a bundle of rights. For example, you can destroy your own property. So uh, that's the right of waste. Clearly, there is the idea that if you own something, you are secure in it. And security of tenure is something that is familiar to people, an idea that's familiar to people in Anglo-Saxon England and after the Norman Conquest as well. And it looks as if those with book land or those for lesser duration who have loan land are secure in their holding so long as they perform the relevant services. It's loan land, it's going to be the payment of rent or possibly other forms of service to their lord, to the person who's given the lease, the lessor. In terms of book land, it is various public duties, such as military service. Another of the rights that is associated with ownership now is of disposal or alienability. And what it looks like is that one of the key characteristics of bookland is that you can give it away or grant it away. Uh, so alienability is there central to the notion of ownership. With leasehold, it's much harder to tell. The two possibilities: one is that you could give it, you could grant it away for the term that you would have enjoyed it for. The other possibility is that you can't grant it away because it's not really yours. It's very hard to tell whether one position or the other is universally true. It may even be slightly more complicated with an intermediate version that you can give it away for the duration of your hold on it, but only with the lessor's permission. Now, heritability 
tends not to be one of the ones that's mentioned within a modern notion of ownership because we do not think so much in terms of uh, the natural thing, natural uh, form of succession to be intestate uh, inheritance. Uh, we think of property as much more disposable. What seems to be the case is the bookland, though, is heritable. I, if you die, your closest heir will get the land. Loan land is only heritable within the terms of the lease. So if it's a lease for three lives, you die and you'll be succeeded possibly by your wife, otherwise by your closest heir, probably your eldest son. Now, in practice, very often leaseholds were renewed. So you may find the same bit of land in the same family, generation after generation after generation. But that is not heritability going on because the lessor at any point, at least in theory, could have said, the last less lessee has died, I'm going to resume it, I'm going to take it back. Okay, great. And if we could now switch to post 1066, what was the land holding system like at that point in time? Okay. After the conquest, lordship becomes much more important in land holding. And this may be because it would be much more important in Normandy and the Normans bring their ideas for land holding. Or it may be because after the Norman conquest, the king has conquered the whole of the land. He grants it to his followers in return for service, and they grant land to their followers in return for service. So you get a much more hierarchical notion of land holding. And imposed on the lands are certain services which the tenant has to fulfill, otherwise the land will be forfeited to the Lord. The strongest form of this land often is referred to as a fief or, or freehold. What do those two words mean? Fief is a word that comes in with the Norman conquest. It seems to indicate land that is heritable and which is uh, held in return for military service. And it is a notion that survives in modern legal terminology with the notion of fee simple, which has become the notion of full ownership. Freehold seems to be a term that's invented probably in the 1160s. And it is peculiar to the common law. Doesn't seem to exist in France. Doesn't actually seem to exist in the Norman lands of the English kings. And what that means is that it is a secure holding in relation to your lord for your life. So by the 13th century, uh, freehold, free tenement is your control over your land during your lifetime. Fee is your family's claim to the land being heritable. Okay, that's fascinating. And the power dynamics involved in that are, are interesting. Um, if I was a tenant, where could I appeal if I thought that my landlord was doing something wrong? Okay. It looks as if in the period up to the middle of the 12th century, there is no routine place you can appeal to if you feel that your lord is mistreating you. Or to put it differently, there's no place above the lordship that you can appeal to. But remember what I said about courts. Courts are made up not of a single judge, so the law's court isn't simply the lord judging. It is made up by the people who tend the court. So if you think that your lord's mistreating you, you go to the law's court, you make a complaint, and your equals, what they would refer to as your peers, should decide the case. Now, they may well not want to displease the Lord. Or they may well feel that if you forfeit your lands, having done something which your Lord said is wrong, they've got a chance to get in the lands themselves. If you are denied justice in your Lord's court, there's no routine place that you can go to. 
What happens from the 1160s is the king starts to provide a set of remedies which allow you to take cases complaining of what the Lord has done wrong to you to the king's courts. And it may be, for example, your Lord has unjustly dispossessed you, or it may be that you're heir, an heir and your father has died and the Lord hasn't allowed you to have the land. So from the 1160s, 1170s, you start to have routine remedies taken, which you can take advantage of in the king's court. And that changes the power dynamic between lord and tenant. That's probably a great um, point to start to talk more abstractly about these things. But first, I, I have to, because it fascinated me, talk about uh, recording transactions very briefly. Um, I think that every American lawyer is extremely frustrated with the concept of recording transactions because uh, taking learning about those things for the bar exam is is awful uh, because they don't make any sense. But I was hoping you could discuss how people recorded transactions very briefly um, during this time. Okay. A transaction has to be witnessed, and that is the most important thing. Uh, I give you land. At what point does it become yours or yours told from me rather than mine? There are various points where you might think it became yours. One is when I say I'm going to give it to you. Second might be that you don't have to have a charter transferred or written and given to you. But it quite often happens. That might be the point. A third is when there is an actual symbolic livery of the land. And it is the third which is the crucial thing. It's the livery of possession, the, what's called the livery of season, which is the vital stage. And that will be recalled by the people who witnessed it. So a charter, if a case turns up later, a charter is not definitive evidence. There has to have been a livery of Sazen, and you, what you do is you get along with people who saw the transfer of land. And the charters themselves, um, while not uh, that wasn't the crucial point, um, they could serve as evidence for the transaction. Specifically, yeah. you talk about um, you talk about a, a, how they used to cut the charters uh, they eventually got to ch cutting the charters uh so the two parties would have uh the charters and then also uh eventually they started cutting it in three so a centralized record keeper could have them yeah this this is a very important development and that last one comes in the 1190s and we actually have the first of these transactions which produces a tripartite three-part document uh, and these are made as a record of a transaction in the king's court. And crucially, they become very popular because, because they provide definitive proof, unlike a charter. And what happens then is people start to have collusive litigation in the king's court in order to get one of these tripartite documents to, rec uh, to record what is in fact a transfer of land. So one party brings a case, uh, the other party caves in, the pertinent party has brought the case, uh, gets the land, but presumably they have probably made a payment to the other party beforehand. This has all been set up, and the aim is to get a definitive record. Okay, got it. I won't dwell on that too much longer. Um, we can start to just talk more generally about uh, the common law now. I think that we have the two substantive areas laid out. First, I just, it seems like from our discussion that criminal law uh, did not change as much as property law. Um, why might that be the case if it is true? I, I think there's certainly less change over the Norman Conquest, and there's probably less change over the period as a whole. The conceptualization of criminal law becomes clearer by about, let's say, 1200. The notion that uh, all cases are either criminal or civil, for example, is there in 1200, and it doesn't seem to be there in 1150. But I think you know, the, the, 
the socioeconomic situation doesn't change hugely, and that is what determines the types of offence that are likely to be important. Furthermore, peacekeeping, as we've said, has always been royal responsibility, and therefore it's always been carried out through the King's Court, County Court, the Hundred Court, those units of local administration that survived the normal conquest. Change in property law was greater, and that is because of the social transformation at the top level of society resulting from the normal conquest. Uh, there's an almost complete replacement of the English aristocracy after 1066. Whereas lower down society, the Norman conquest isn't a mass migration, it's thousands of people, uh, not tens of thousands of people. And therefore, the level of society where most crime is going on, there's continuity of the population. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, I will ask the million dollar question what is the common law? The common law can mean various things. By 1200, by 1220, common law just means standard law. Uh, so it is law common to the realm. Contrasted often with, for example, local custom, or local, or contrasted with a special agreement. So, well, as everyone knows, certain forms of contract can remove things from standard legal arrangements, or in a sense, from the default legal arrangement, which is what the common law is. Secondly, you could talk about common law contrasted with other legal systems. And common law, by the end of the 12th century in England, it's very much becoming associated with the custom of the king's court, most notably in relation to property. And thirdly, and this isn't a sense that it has in our period, uh, you can talk about common law as opposed to, for example, statute, or common law as opposed to equity. The notion of equity exists in the 12th century, but it is, in a sense, something that is contrasted with the rigor of the law, rather than being a jurisdictional notion. And statutes only become significant, really, from the mid-13th century onwards. So it is the broad sense of common law of being something that is standardized procedures, uh, enforced in certain routine ways, and common to the whole of the area uh, under that common law, which is the core notion of common law for these purposes, and how they would have thought of common law by 1200. It's interesting because I think we have... Uh at least in modern times, this conception of the common law as being sort of this decentralized thing, uh, ver maybe versus more continental systems where it is much more statute based, for example. But in your book a lot, it just seems like the process of forming the common law, at least, is actually a very centralized thing. And there is a lot about regularity uh, and, and frankly, bureaucratization at a very low level is there a tension between you know, decentralized custom and the common law, or are they compatible? How do those two things interact? I think the thing to point out, first of all, is that England is small by the standards of European polities at the time. Uh, so if you think of a France being made up of various duchies and counties, uh, Germany being made up similarly of duchies and counties. Uh, England in some ways is more the size of one of those duchies or counties rather than of one of these kingdoms. So it is small. So centralization is within a relatively small geographical area. But yes, there, there is a tension. Uh, and the, I think, crucial here for allowing the tension not to get out of hand is that preservation of the Anglo-Saxon local units. That whilst there is centralization, 
particularly of certain types of important action, uh, notably actions concerning land. A lot of justice is still being done in the localities. So, for example, most litigation concerning debt probably is going on in county courts. Furthermore, as I pointed out, crucial are the itinerant justices. So in terms of centralization, you haven't got all the justice being dispensed with in Westminster. What you have is the King's justices traveling out, meeting in, hearing cases in the places where county courts probably normally met, in front of a lot of the people who are normally attending county courts. But this has become, they are sitting in this case as the King's Court, and crucially, the cases are now being decided not by the people who make up by the court, but in a sort of dual way by the King's Justices, who are acting as what we think of as judges, plus select bodies, generally of 12 people, who are providing verdicts, be it about criminal cases, but more particularly about land cases. So you've moved from a system where royal justice very much acting as president, presidents, of course, to ones where they're acting as judges instead. So justice is still going on in the localities, but the central royal justices have the control of it and are using the custom of the king's court in the localities. Right. And we were discussing earlier, very briefly, about how that causes sort of a blowback. And I think that's a good transition point to Magna Carta. Obviously, uh, everyone knows what Magna Carta is, um, but I'm wondering why is it in this book about the formation of the common law? What role does the what role does Magna Carta play in the formation of the common law? Okay, it plays various roles, but one is as a good endpoint, and one is as a good start point. Uh, it's an end point because it shows, as you said, the, the political tensions that arise from the logic of reform. One is the focus on royal justice. Royal justice has become more important, and therefore if people don't like it, or don't think justice is available, they're going to blame the royal administration. Second is personal, that King John, who has to issue Magna Carta, uh, is probably more involved in the administration of justice than his immediate predecessors. And that is because he is much more focused on England than either his brother, who was his immediate predecessor, or his father had been. And he seemed very keen on being involved in justice, and this leads to him being personally blamed. But the third element is structural rather than personal. And that is, we've talked about the extension of the availability of royal remedies, in particular in relation to land and in particular in relation to free tenements. Two lots of people don't benefit from this. One are the, what's called the villains, the lower peasantry, because they don't hold free tenements. The others are the people who have their lands immediately from the king. So you asked earlier about this question, what you do when your lord doesn't behave. And I said that in the uh, Anglo-Norman period, you probably didn't have routine access to remedy above the lordship. For most people, the Angevin reforms created that remedy through royal intervention. However, if you are someone who holds directly at the king, king misbehaves for you, to you, there's nothing you can do about it because there isn't a superior lord you can appeal to. What Magna Carta do, seeks to do is to make sure that the rules that apply to great lords also apply to the king. So in that way, it's in a sense the fulfillment of the process of reform. As a starting point, crucially Magna Carta is the first document that is routinely referred to in court. 
So what it provides is some written rules of law, which are definitive. And therefore, it is the model for further statutory legislation. And it is the model for how statutes are used in court. So by the second half, and particularly by the last quarter of the 13th century, you have a change in the way that law develops with the development of statute law. And you get the pattern developing that's familiar now, have a problem, legislate about it, lawyers try and find ways around the legislation, legislate some more, try and find some more loopholes and so on. So Magna Carta is the transition point towards that sort of legal development through, lit writ through written text. That's very interesting. And, um, and, and probably a, a topic for another podcast. So I won't, I won't go too into it here, but that's, that's a very helpful summary. I think I've discussed everything I would like to about your book. However, this is the Use Comune podcast, and I need to ask you about common law and the Use Comune. Um, is the common law a part of the Use Comune? Sorry, I'm wondering how tactful I need to be. Uh, I think the first thing is to say that by the late 12th century, the phrase Use Comune in Europe, as well as England, is being used in the way that I am talking, I've been talking about. Just as the standard law, as opposed to special agreement or local custom. The notion of it as something that is specifically based on Roman and canon law, what we think of as the basis of the civil law systems, develops rather later than this. Uh, so if you look, for example, at French law books of the late 13th century, when they talk about the vernacular equivalent of jus commune, they just mean standard law. Common law and jus commune are, of course, the same, exactly the same phrase. Uh, jus commune in English is simply common law. And the reason for the two terms being used differently is by historians and lawyers now, is simply to avoid confusion between the two systems. So the ideas are not just parallel, uh, the phrases are identical. I don't think one can see common law as part of the jus commune. Uh, what some jus commune scholars would have seen at the time might argue now is that jus commune always has a place for what are called jura propria, uh, specific laws. So that the fact that common law doesn't conform to jus commune doesn't mean that it can't be fitted within the conceptual framework of European law having a standard law and then various other local laws. And what jus commune then provides is what happens if the local law, the jus proprium, doesn't provide a remedy. However, I don't think that's really primarily what you're driving at which is how similar is common law and jus commune. They are, they are distinctly different. Uh, they are different, for example, in conceptions of property. They are different in uh, procedural matters, classically uh, ju uh, jury trial in common law and in criminal law in the jus commune system, inquisitorial trial. Uh, so the differences of practice are very considerable. It also needs to be pointed out, though, that common law and much continental law are quite similar, certainly going into the mid, probably the later 13th century. Uh, so the idea that because common English common law isn't just commune doesn't mean that it's different from continental law. People in Northern France, Roman lawyers in Northern France are very aware that custom is predominant. Even in somewhere like North Italy, which is the heartland of the Jus Commune. Venice, for example, is very keen that Venetian law is not like the law of 
the yes, Commune. It is Venetian laws, it's Venetian, the customs and usages of Venice. So the fact that uh, common law is different from Yus Commune doesn't actually make it an outlier, certainly in the period we've been talking about, certainly into the period up to about 1270 and even beyond. Having said that, the aspiration towards having law as some sense a science, legal science, and that it should be conceived of as some sort of intellectual system which you study and which you have aspirations for to have it in a systematic fashion. I think that almost certainly is influence there from the started sort of study in schools and universities of Roman and canon law. I think it does have an effect on how the people who are creating the common law want to think about the common law. And it may actually be that the periods at the end of the time we've been talking about, so from about, well, from the 1160s to about the 1260s, may actually be the high point of this intellectual aspiration. Once the legal profession really gets going in England, it becomes very much a practical profession. If you're thinking in your terms, uh, probably uh, the analogy would be that uh, lawyers, uh, becoming professional lawyers in later medieval England, do the sort of stuff you have to do for a bar exam, learn a bunch of stuff for a fairly practical purpose. Uh, they are not doing the intellectual side of legal learning, which would now be done in a law school, and which the people in the US community system were again doing in law schools in universities. Okay, thank you for, for that very textured and thoughtful answer. I have to, my take is uh, the common law is part of the use community because I couldn't post this episode if it wasn't. Uh, so that's how, that's where I stand. Um, of course, what I'm working on at the moment is a comparison of the development of English law with French, North Italian, and ecclesiastical law during the period from about the mid 12, 1160s to the mid 1260s looking at precisely this question of whether there's divergence between English law and continental law, or whether there are multiple divergences, and also the question of influence from continental law to English law. And this eventually will become a book. It is proving very complicated, and that is the fascination of the issues, making it even more complicated. That's fascinating. And that sounds like it'd be a great uh, episode for the future once it once it's finished. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a pleasure. Uh, take care.